And it's my great pleasure to introduce Enrico, Enrico Marchioni, who will be speaking about a symbolic approach to quantitative strategic interactions. Please, Enrico. Can you hear me? Can you hear my voice? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a couple of words about this. Uh, this talk is going to be very informal. The results about this are quite technical, but I'm actually not going to talk about any result at all. Okay. Uh, being informal means also that I'm going to be a little imprecise when it comes to defining certain things. So especially for those who know about, uh, about these logics, about this from a technical point of view, I apologize. I'm going to be very, very informal so that hopefully everybody can understand because the ideas behind this are very simple to understand for everybody if, if you have never worked on anything like this. And uh, the second, of, uh, second thing is that uh, this is going to be about games. And especially, I'm going to focus, at least in this talk, on non-cooperative games in normal forms. Okay? So even if I don't mention it anymore, this is what I'm going to talk about. You can extend these same ideas to the cooperative setting and also to extensive games, for instance. But this is beside the point of this talk. So. Um, the essential idea behind this comes from the classical approach that you find in computer science concerning then the representation of games. Okay? Now, in the last 20 or even 30 years, uh, mobile and network computing has become ubiquitous. Okay? We rely more and more on computers to perform certain tasks. Why? Because the computers have become much more pow powerful, highly interconnected, and so they can handle automatically highly complex tasks. Okay? Now, many of these tasks require social interactions and are actually transferred to the computers because they can perform better, more precisely, hopefully, and so on. A an example of this is software that you find. Now, it's very common to find algorithmic trading, automated betting, automated bidding, gaming bots, for instance. So we have software that uses artificial principles in artificial intelligence to interact with other agents and make decisions, something that humans used to do or are still doing, but now they're doing it in an automatic way. Now, all right, okay. so one of the features of these systems in this case is that they need to exhibit strategic behavior. Essentially, they must act like self-interested agents in multiplayer games, okay? So, uh, these computers, or the software, let's say, okay, they have private goals. They have a certain strategy. And they have to interact with each other by following their strategies and making decisions depending on what others do. Okay? And they can interact either cooperating or not with each other. Okay? Now, in computer science, of course, we're very interested in understanding how these systems behave. Because, after all, they are computer systems. Okay? So, the idea is that we must be able, in order to understand how they behave, to evaluate the performance. We want to know exactly if their behavior conforms to a certain protocol, if they follow certain desirable rules, so that we can actually evaluate if they're doing the things that we want them to do. For instance, if this group of agents, I only talk about agents, but by agents, my, essentially I mean computer programs, okay? When we have a system of agents, we want to, for instance, check whether certain agents follow a certain behavior, or in the system as a whole, for instance, since it's a game, after all, they are playing a strategic interaction, if the system, for instance, have equilibria. Okay? So we want to be able to check if the systems and the players in the system uh, have certain desirable properties. Now, the logic-based approach in artificial intelligence is logic-based, which means that it uses logical languages to specify the properties of these systems. What I mean by that is that through formulas of the logic, I can say that the agents have certain properties, or the systems have certain properties, or if the agents behave in a certain way, then certain properties follow, for instance. Okay? Now, using logical language, I can specify, so describe the properties I want to be able to check or I want to talk about for these systems. And then through the process of model checking, what we do is that we see, we check effectively if the system satisfies or not these properties. Not only one, I want a language that makes, me, makes it possible for me to describe how the system behave, I also want to have tools that makes it possible to check whether systems or certain models 
do follow the certain rules, do conform to certain protocol, protocols, and so on. Okay? Now, this, the classical, typical approach that you find in artificial intelligence, logic-based approach to artificial, in artificial intelligence, uh, sees the agents as uh, players in a, in a situation of strategic interaction that is purely qualitative. And this, is, this depends on the fact that you're actually using logical models. What I mean by this is that players are seen as goal-oriented agents, and the objectives of this player, the goals that this player have, are essentially encoded through the use of propositional formulas. Okay? What we heard about in the previous talk is, uh, comes, in, you know, comes in handy now because We've seen before what, you, what is a Boolean propositional formula, right? So a Boolean propositional formula is essentially a formula that is either true or false. Now, with these formulas, we actually encode the goals of these agents. So in this strategic interaction, we express goals and properties of these agents through formulas, okay? Now, what this means is that agents make strategic choices in order to make these formulas true, since we are representing the goals through the formulas, what the agents want to do in these models is to make the formula true, which means realizing a private goal, for instance. Now, this, of course, is in striking, con striking contrast with the to the mathematical representation of games. Okay? The classical representation of non-cooperative games, for instance, is based on a quantitative model, essentially. Okay? Agents are seen as, as, as seen as economic players that when they make choices, hmm, try, to, try to maximize their outcome in general. Okay? So the logical models simply describe agents, sorry, with a goal, and what they want to do is to realize their goal, and these approaches are essentially symbolic and qualitative just because they effectively use logic, okay? While the mathematical models are numerical and quantitative. We don't, from a certain point of view, in the logical models we talk about achieving something. In the mathematical models we talk about how much money we can get. Okay? So of course there's a clear bridge, to, sorry, there's a clear gap a gap between these two approaches that our intention is to bridge. Now, uh, the basic concepts of a model of a game that you can find in the logical approaches in artificial intelligence is, can be formalized through the concept of a Boolean game. So in a Boolean game, that I'm going to give a formal definition in a minute, but informally you have a finite set of players. And each player controls a set of variables. What I mean by this is that play, each player has the unique ability of assigning a value to one of these variables or to more of these variables, okay? In addition, the player also has a formula that represents the goal of this agent. Now, what, what does it mean that the, the player assigns a value to the proportional variable? Sign a value means assigning their zero or one. You can interpret the, value, the variable as an action. Assigning zero or one to this, to this variable can be seen as deciding to take or not this action, okay? So the strategic choice made by the player is to either assign one or zero to the propositional variables con controlled by the player, which means taking or not the particular action that P is meant to represent in this case, okay? Now, each strategy combination is actually an assignment to the old variables made, made by the players in the game, okay? Now, achieving a goal, which is assigned to each agent, okay, now depends on the strategic choices made by the players, of course, which means it depends on the valuation, so on the actions the player decides to take or not. Now, formally, a Boolean game is just a table of this kind. We have a finite set of players, a finite set of proportional variables. Each agent has, is, is in control of a subset of these variables. And what I mean by it is that Every variable in the game is assigned to a player, but each variable is assigned to one player and one player only. Okay? So players don't share variable. Now, um, what is the strategy space of each player? Strategy space of each player is nothing but the set of all possible assignments to the proportional variables controlled by the player. So essentially the set of all possible actions taken or not taken <coughs> with respect to the variables that are assigned to a specific player. Now, this formula, this goal formula, can be seen as a payoff formula, actually. And the payoff formula, which is built from the variables in the game, okay, has a corresponding payoff function that is the formula that is assigned to this function here. Uh, now, it should be clear from the, from the talk we heard before, but essentially, 
the way you define a, a, a function for this formula is simply assign zero, one to the proportional variables. You take the interpretation of the connectives, and then you just you do this for all valuation, you generate a function. And this function is what's called a Boolean function. Any function of this kind is called a Boolean function, and a very important result in logic says that formulas in classical logic always define a Boolean function, but also vice versa. For every Boolean function, there always is a formula of the logic that defines the Boolean function. Now, take this example, for instance. Suppose that I'm player P, P1, and you are player P2. I control P, and you control Q and R. Now, my goal here is this one, and your goal is this one. Now, if you look at it, you can see that uh, for me to make this true, which means to achieve my goal, I depend completely on what you do, because I control variable Q, P that occurs only in my formula. So I have no influence on, what, on you achieving your goal. I have influence only you know, with respect to my goal. But even in this case, I control P, and here I have P and, or not P, which is always one, so it's always true. So actually, the value of my formula, whether it's true or not, depends only on Q, which you control, for instance. Okay? While in the case, the second player controls Q and R, so you are the, uh, the ones who decide whether your formula, whether your, your goal is achieved or not. Okay? Now, this is important because uh, this is what we can use actually to build a critique of the approach on Boolean games. Now, here you can see that the binary nature of goals trivializes the nature of the strategic interaction. Here we're talking about achieving a goal or not. Simple as that. Okay? But most of all, we are indifferent between all outcomes that satisfy a goal. Okay? And also indifferent between all outcomes that do not satisfy a goal. Okay? As long as I satisfy my goal, so I make my formula true, it doesn't matter which strategic choice I make. The same thing for the strategic choices that do not realize my goal. Okay? So in the previous example, for instance, if you, go, if you go back, you can realize your goal if you assign one to Q or R or to both. What helps you discriminate which choice you should make? What's your preferred choice? You don't know. You don't have any way to know because what matters is simply for you to achieve your goal. All right? So essentially, these choices produce the same outcomes in the models defined Boolean game, they give you no criteria to distinguish among these, cho among these choices. Okay? So in Boolean games, actually, there is no way to determine which strategies are preferred by the players. Okay? Now, if you look at it from comparing the games here, I have a finite set of players. You have a certain strategy space, which might be finite or infinite in, in a classical representation of games. Here, you simply have all the set of valuations of the propositional variables you control. And you have a pair of functions defined over the set of strategy combinations that takes a real value here. You simply have Boolean function. Now, the goal here is to maximize your payoff. You can talk about maximization here from a certain point of view, because what you want is one, which is the maximum in this case. But actually, maximizing here doesn't make it possible for you to give a preference order, for instance, on your choices. Something that you can talk about here. You can talk about best response and so on. Okay? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, with the Boolean game, mm -hmm. you produce a special case of game. Yeah. And then um, it may not have a pure strategy of equilibrium, we know that. Yeah. Because it is a finite game. But apart from that, I mean, I mean uh, yeah, but, well, it's just a special case. Yeah, no, but the, the point I'm making is that this is the case that you use in logic-based representations in artificial intelligence. And this is not enough to capture many situations of strategic interaction. It's an oversimplification. So what I'm saying is that... Uh -huh. so I don't understand the question mark. Uh -huh. Ah, so I don't get your point. I mean, my preferences, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, preferences on what? Obviously, my preferences on my strategies depend mm -hmm. on uh, what I think the other players are doing. And this is exactly as in every other game. Yeah, but you see, you don't start from, in, in Boolean games, you don't start from that point of view. That, the idea is that you want to have a logical model that makes it possible. You want to have a logical language that makes it possible to talk about and represent strategic interactions. It turns out that the logical model that they used is not enough to express certain things. So I'm just pointing out the fact that you cannot express these things. It's not that we chose this model and we don't care about preferences. I don't, I don't know if you... Mm -hmm. Is that uh, maybe they don't have uh, equilibrium? 
No, they do actually do, but. Okay. Well, well they are finite games. Yes. So how yeah. do I know whether a finite game has any? I don't, I don't have an existence yeah. theorem unless there are yeah. certain properties are satisfied. Mm -hmm. yeah. But how they are they? They just eat, the, you know, special games. Yeah, I know. So I, I, I don't understand that what you are claiming that they are not uh, rich enough to express strategic interaction. I understand that you yeah. may want to have a richer yeah. language for goals yeah. and stuff. I understand that, but. Uh, no, no, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, let's put it this way. I don't find anything wrong with Boolean games, okay? I'm just saying, if you want to express certain things, they are not enough. And this is the common approach. This is what the common approach that you generally find in logic-based artificial intelligence. What I'm saying is that, okay, if you want certain things, for instance, if you want to express preference for other things, this is not enough. The problem is this is the language that is being used. So certain things are constantly added to the language to make it possible. Yeah, but the point is in artificial intelligence, you want more. And this is not enough. So, in my opinion, you are not being clear about uh, the lack of expressibility. Well, but this is what obvious. I don't understand. So in my opinion, you are not being clear about uh, what you want to express that is not there. Well, I want to have a language that makes it possible to express, to represent a wider class of, of games. Not only this. Because if I pick this language, that's not expressive enough. That's the, that's the point of the old, of the old, uh, okay. of the old work. So, uh, so, well, the point is exactly that, okay, so if we keep using this language, we're not able to express, it's not expressive enough to uh, represent certain kinds of strategic interaction, especially quantitative interactions that we want to, we want to represent. So the idea here is essentially to change the logics and use Lukasiewicz logics and their associated functions because this makes it possible to express a much wider class of games. Sorry? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, why Lukasiewicz logics, first of all? First of all, Lukasiewicz logic generalized classical logic. So, certain results we have for Boolean games, we can recover for Lukasiewicz logic as well. Okay? Now, Lukasiewicz logics are logics of a rich class of linear polynomial functions, and what I mean by that, I'll explain in a minute. Okay. So formulas of Lukasiewicz logic can be used to specify real valued functions. So essentially, instead of using Boolean functions to, talk, to specify the payoffs in a game, I can use formulas in Lukasiewicz logic to specify these functions. So I can offer a symbolic representation of quantitative properties to the formulas of Lukasiewicz logic. What's very important is that I can achieve much greater expressive power and no additional computational cost. Because in fact, the classical problem like satisfiability of formals for Lukasiewicz logic is no harder in Lukasiewicz logic than it is for classical logic. So when, you want, when it comes to computation, this is very important. Now, functions of Lukasiewicz logic can be used to actually to approximate, certain functions can be used to approximate continuous functions. So you can ask in this case, so why do you pick Lukasiewicz logic? You pick these functions because you could pick other classes of functions, okay? Uh, the thing is that it depends on which functions you pick. You might have a jumping complexity class that doesn't make it worth studying. Okay? But look at these logics. The functions of look at these logics are expressive enough to approximate continuous functions. So when it comes to expressive powers, there's a, great, a, a better trade-off between expressive power and computational complexity. Now, uh, a couple of words about uh, Lucas series logic. Now, forget, forget the slides there because uh, it's going to take uh, too much time to explain what I mean by that. But what's most important here is that, first of all, we see uh, Lukasiewicz logics as having two subclasses. One is infinite valid logics, and the other one is finite valid logics. For the infinite valid logics, what's important is that the class of functions we can define. So the class of functions we can define with Lukasiewicz logics are, is the logic of continuous piecewise linear polynomial function with integer and rational coefficients. What I mean by this is that if you take a function that is continuous over 0, 1, uh, okay, what it means is that there exist finitely many linear polynomials, p1, pm, okay, so that for each x on in 0, 1, okay, f of x, Mm -hmm. is always given, the value of f of x for every x is always given by one of these polynomial, okay? 
Now, if we polynomials have rational coefficients, we talk about rational McNaughton functions. If the uh, polynomials have integer coefficients, we simply talk about McNaughton functions, okay? Now, these are infinite value Lucas series logics. The finite value Lucas series logics are essentially the restrictions of these functions here over this set. Now, this is not 100% precise, but for the purpose of this, of this talk is, you, you should take it like this, okay? So you take those functions, you restrict them over this set, and you take, and you get the, for, the functions associated to formulas in a finite value Lucas series logic. The idea now is to define games by fixing every time a logic. The fact that I can fix a logic depends on the kind of games I want to represent. Of course, I can make a general study of this, but when I want to represent a specific game, for instance, I, I'm gonna fix a logic. So the definition of a Lucas series game is exactly the same as in the case of a Boolean game. You have a finite set of players, a uh, finite set of proportional variables. Each player controls a subset of the variables. Now, the difference is the strategy space is the set of all valuations of, that a player can give to the variables the player controls. But now the values are taken from L here, where L is either the real unit interval, if it's an infinite game, or LK if it's a finite game, okay? Now, we define this game by fixing a logic. So now we'll have a formula, which, our pay, which is our payoff formula, so that the function associated to the formula is the payoff functions. Now this function here uh, will have an interpretation depending on the set you fix and the logic you fix, of course, but it will be one of these McNaughton functions or the restrictions, okay? Um, how much time do I have? Yeah. So, of course now, Strategy, an assignment, a specific assignment by each player, is what you call a strategy combination. You can define the concept of the best response if fixing the valuations of the choice made by other players, okay? Um, you take the value of the function by fixing the values, the choice made by the other players, okay? So you have, of course, a, a best response when there is no change in the values you give to your variables that uh, gives you a greater value of the function, of your payoff function, okay? Now, this is simply a very trivial reinterpretation of the concept of payoff function, special case, by using the functions that are associated to the, um, to the formulas of Lucas series logic, okay? And similarly, you can define a concept of pure strategy Nash equilibrium, okay? Here, the basic idea is essentially you take the payoff function of a player and the payoff function is given by a formula, so its interpretation corresponds to one function of this class. So here, there is no mixed strategy. This is all pure strategy, okay. Okay, now I'll give you a couple of examples of things, if I uh, if I have time, I'll go back to the previous examples, but uh, take a generalization, for instance, of the prisoner's dilemma over zero, one, okay? Now this is something, for instance, in the case of Boolean games you cannot do, okay? There exists some kind of generalization of the prisoner's dilemma, but this has nothing to do with this, and doesn't really correspond in a certain sense to the classical case, but anyway. Now, take two prisoners that are accused of committing a crime, just exactly as in the classical case. So each prisoner can, only, can either testify, so, and what, uh, testify, so uh, defect, or don't, uh, can decide not to testify, so co uh, cooperate. What I mean by that is that you cooperate if you cooperate with your fellow criminals, so you stay silent. You defect, if you decide to uh, give the evidence that you have, so, to confess, all right? So, each prisoner can simply fully cooperate with their fellow criminal and remain silent or give away all the, the evidence they have. Since we want to formalize over zero one, we can also talk about prisoners that can choose to partially confess, providing more or less information, more or less evidence to the police about the crimes committed, okay? So, here, Zero means full cooperation, one means full defection, and any X in between is the degree of defection, so in a certain sense, the amount of evidence given uh, in the confession, okay? So if you take the classical matrix, the two by two, this is simply our interpretation over zero, one of the classical case, okay? Well, of course, you have an equilibrium where you both prisoners decide to defect, okay? Now, of course, we want to extend this, we fully extend this over zero, one. So the idea here is simply to um, 
use this as coordinate points, and you define the functions that uh, give you the payoff, the payoff functions, one for each player, okay? And this happens to be functions that you can actually express with the language of Lukasiewicz logic, okay? Now, this as long as my calculations are correct, of course. Um, so, uh, the idea here is that not only you can express this, so you can generalize the classical case, this also uh, respects the intuition you have about the classical case, when, for instance, by choosing one is strictly dominant strategy, for instance, no? And you still have, you have, you have, an, you have an equilibrium, not in that case, but in this case, you have an equilibrium when both players uh, fully defect, of course. And, uh, okay. and how much time do we have? I should be uh, two minutes. Okay, so I'll just, uh, I won't take any more of your time. So the idea here is uh, essentially this. Sorry. So. To define new models of games based on Lukashevich's logic. The reason behind this is that we want to have, as I said before, a language that makes it possible to encode real value functions so we can have a language to actually describe this and then actually check the properties of, of these games. Uh, we have studied games with finite and infinite strategy spaces based on the kind of logic you fix, but what matters the most is that you have a a class of logics that all belong to the same family, and you can give a, general, give a general study from the mathematical point of view and the logical point of view of these games in the languages uh, of these logics, okay? Actually, we obtain a char characterization of the existence of equilibria for both finite and infinite games, and we also study the computational properties, so checking if equilibria exist in the game, and so on. And uh, this is essentially what we are uh, working on now. This, we've done a lot, and but there's much more to be done. So, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Enrico, for being very much on time. Are there any questions that do not require a whiteboard for an answer? I have one, if I may. Uh, I, was very, uh, I was very surprised by the generalized prisoner's dilemma, I think. Never, I never saw that before. Uh, can you go back to the... Where? Well, uh, well the, the, the payoff matrix would be fine. Uh, how would you... I mean, uh, as a, the old problem I always have with degrees of things. Uh, how do you pick the actual X for my giving away evidence? I mean, I understand the idea that I give away some evidence or more evidence that you do give away, but how do you actually pick the real number about the evidence? So let's say we are two criminals and I decide to give away some evidence and you decide to do the same. And so you want me to quantify how much evidence I've given and how much evidence you've given. Well, it's a good problem. The thing is that you should define a model. For instance, uh, the thing is that it should depend on the evidence you have, on how much you're willing to give away. So you take this, and I'm assuming you, you can quantify this you know, over a finite scale in that case. So if you quantify it over a finite scale uh, by adding more and more evidence, for instance, I don't know. Let's say you have, uh, I don't know, you committed five crimes, okay? You're willing to testify that you committed with this person five crimes, okay? If you talk about none of them, then you have zero. If you talk about one of them, then you have, until you talk about all of them. So in that case, you would need a finite scale, but what matters here is you can define a restriction over in this case, I'm assuming um, L4, Lukashevich logic with, four, with five truth values. And so you can define a restriction over that of this, in a certain sense. 
So if you wanted to formalize this from this very practical point of view, in principle, you could, you could do it. The thing is always, how do you exactly quantify the specific thing? But this is, uh, in general, a problem. You know, if you want to give a mathematical model of something, it's the same when you have preferences, for instance. You know? it's, uh, do you want to talk about simply the order, or do you want to talk exactly about a number that tells you how much you prefer something? Uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Context will tell you but which the, one. Yeah. This, this example is essentially, it comes from this, from this, uh, okay? So since you have this here, uh, even if you have, if you see this from an ordinal point of view, you don't see it as numbers, uh, this matrix right here, I don't know how you can represent it in a Boolean game, because if you have different values, you have four different values in this case, okay? So the idea of using infinite value as if it's logic is the fact that you can express this. But if in a Boolean game you have zero and one, but when you have zero and one, what do you have here? You must have zero or one because you're using a Boolean function, so your output must be zero or one. So, but this is something you can actually do with Lucasivis games that you cannot do in that case, for instance. The more questions? Yeah. Actually, comment even on both talks. I mean, both talks, for instance, degree of truth represent utility in some sense because this, in your case, this is okay. This is. Yeah, so, I should, I should say that. But, but for me, degree of truth can be degree of anything. I mean, you, it, is, it is the degree of utility here because you maximize. I mean, you formalize your problem such as you would like to maximize the degree of truth, finding the strategies that maximize degree of truth. But actually, degree of truth can be degree of anything. For instance, I mean, some other researchers, including you probably, have done some uh, works uh, where they take modalities that represent uncertainty and have degrees uh, of uncertainty represented by, by uh, modality, I mean, many valued modalities. In that case, the degree of truth of, the mo of model psi is a degree of uncertainty of psi. So for me, the, the fact that the truth can be utility, yes, it can be, but it can be anything. No, no, actually, I, I agree with you. And more to the point, I honestly, I give you my honest opinion, I don't care if you call this truth. To me, that plays absolutely no role in this model. To me, the value of the model is simply the fact that I have a symbolic way to represent a class of real valued functions. It comes, it comes just down to that. So this is more expressive because I can have real valued payoff functions that are richer than the Boolean case, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, in the fact that you use this as an utility is, is simply, uh, here I'm just exploiting the fact that you define classes of functions, period. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, as it is in this case. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's thank Eric again. <laughs> <laughs>